Go. Okay, give me just one second to get my meeting in the middle. Yeah, it looks different on the screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it looks like a different story. Yanni is, has a uh, little bit of a congestive thing, so he was time enough to stay at home and not pack it, so thank you. Oh. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I better go. Uh, and Melissa, um, she she has surgery and she says I'm feeling well, so she's not going to be here tonight. So and thinking about her. Did you see that? Yes, I saw that. So no, Sheree. Okay. So we're all here that are supposed to be here. So meeting call to order. You got the recording started. Um, I will go ahead and read the planning commission land acknowledgement. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that we are on a traditional land of rich and diverse group of native peoples who have called this area home for more than 10,000 years. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the descendants of these native peoples who are still here today. Um, did everybody get a chance to take a peek at the agenda? Okay. If there aren't any issues with it, somebody want to make a motion to approve the agenda? To approve the agenda as published. Second. Second. Discussion? Favor? I, I approved. Okay. And then um, how about the meeting minutes? Did everybody get a chance? I know Maddie, you and I were gone. I believe you were gonna listen to the recording. I did and I looked at the meeting minutes, and so I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes. Awesome. Second. Okay. Mm. Second. Any discussion? Cool. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay. We're just cruising through this. Um Okay, so meeting dates. We know this group here, we have our next meeting date is November 12th. Um, is there any issues with that date? If there was another meeting, it sounds like you guys were trying to come up. Yeah, I think we'll put that in just a yeah. minute. November 12th, any issues? No. Where are you going to Possibly, but I don't know. For certain for a week or so. Oh, I'm hoping I'm going to be whisked away. It's my wedding anniversary, but oh. probably not. So we'll see you guys. <laughs> um, so it sounds like we'll have a full house. Um, Actually, I will probably miss. I you'll miss. Like that evening. Okay. okay. So Sam, possibly David. Big possibility on that. Um, <laughs> so then you want to talk about the city council meeting? Yes. That, uh, thank you. Uh, the comprehensive plan been transmitted to city council September 26th. The review now is started in an electronic form and a big binder, along with a cover letter and the annotated memo. We didn't add the glossary yet, so we're gonna augment that. Through the deputy mayor, um, they came up with a, a draft uh, series of meetings, building on existing work sessions and existing council meetings that was circulated and balanced with their ongoing work with the budget. So they have a lot on their hands. They, they, ha they have found acceptable at this point, those review dates through December 2nd and a likely public hearing at city council on December 2nd with a possibility of adoption on December 12th. So a lot of work between now and then. What, what isn't included right now is what we discussed prior about a, a joint planning commission city council session possibly on Saturday. Okay. That doesn't mean we won't. It's just not in, currently included in the anticipated calendar. Um, we had a switchover at SCJ, Christina, but she's still with us through a separate contract between consents uh, through December to help us at city council with that comprehensive plan review. So that's now in place. The item tonight is separate, even though it's SCJ. So as of right now, that schedule is set through December at City Council, uh, and we'll uh, start this Thursday night at a 6 p.m. work session with housing, and then uh, flex from there. So that's where we stand on from that. Any comments or budget? Or... So that Saturday is still a possibility. Uh, yes, it was discussed in prior meetings, yeah. discussed in the planning commission, dates floated around. Then we had the um, uh, situation with the consultants. Right. And during that time with the budget discussions and everything else that's coming, their schedules and anticipating the holidays and your schedules, right now it's out. It's out. Got it. 
Yeah. And what tape was that again? I thought it was like the middle of October, was that? Yeah. October. Like it was coming up soon. It was mid October on a Saturday, like and the then 18th. late October on um, Friday. Okay. But those dates went by the wayside. Oh. We're not pushing for extra meetings, just want to make sure. That. <laughs> yeah. I certainly am not. Yeah. So they have an anticipated schedule at council that uh, could get the uh, review done. But we're still trying to have that meeting. So, uh, not at this minute. Okay. So I could send a doodle pull out for us if we wanted to just check Mondays and Saturdays. Yeah. I, my suggestion is let's get through this Thursday night with housing, see what that balance between budget and everything else is going, see how the, the full council feels, and then go from there. How does that work if, so let's say we don't do the meeting, but then the council has questions? Then, then is that what do they do? Do they reach out to us for exactly? Ideally, okay. Christina is uh, framing them, receiving them. The first set is due tomorrow at eight eight a.m. And then um, having an editable document the whole time. Thursday night focus on housing. So those comments will go through the deputy mayor to Christina, and we'll have that kind of working progression. If at any moment they have a specific question or need uh, through the chair or vice chair, we can accommodate coming to a meeting, yeah. participating remotely, or just trading emails, depending on what the issue is. So unless we know differently, those questions will be directed to the consultant. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say without knowing what they are uh -huh. um, or to what degree. Uh -huh. In other words, the work is great, if everything goes swimmingly and there's clarifications, we can handle that uh -huh. through Christina. If there is a check back on equity or something, then the opportunity is to bring in a planning commissioner to represent or be part of that discussion and then hold open the opportunity for both bodies to meet. If it's at that high level, what are we doing? So just hold our horses until for this week. Yeah. This week. Yeah. And, and, I don't anticipate surprising you Friday with, hey, give me two dates in the next four, 48 hours. <laughs> October is very busy. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we have a plan to get through October with the existing dates and resources we have. Uh, and then November becomes the opportunity. Pretty good on that. Yeah. And, and we have a city council liaison Report coming up later in the agenda if you want to okay. and I dive in further. Great. And we have a, a new friend online that will, <laughs> I guess, wait to get, it's always get with there. SCJ or, for yeah. mental housing. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> well, wait just a second yeah. there. Do you want to talk about the other item that we had too, which was the climate policy advisory schedule? I do. I was hoping uh, the, there's three members of the planning commission that are on this climate element task force, three members of the Climate Action Committee, one member of the tree board. Uh, the city council in September approved the contract with Cascadia. Well, and everything blends together. Last Friday, we had our initial kickoff internal staff to staff. Yes. I shared the dates that were solidified for budget, comp plan, and everything else between now and January with Cascadia. I was hoping yesterday or today that doodle poll would come out to the seven climate policy advisory team members, and they would choose an initial date, pretty pretty straightforward, elect a chair, vice chair, ground rules, expectations. Here we go. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm hoping for tomorrow. Who are those seven people? Uh, Yanni, Lois, and David. And then I'm stretching my memory Sarah. for C C A C. Anna, Anne, say Anne or Anna? Google it. Sarah. Yeah, Victoria, Stacy, Jessica. Two alternates, yeah. And then uh, Miriam. Yeah, Miriam Bertram. So, existing uh, commissions and committees already vetted, already into the ground rules. November, December, January, to really start working with Cascadia on the two sub elements and get those going into 2025. So we don't have any meeting dates that we need to discuss with that group. 
not with the planning commission. No. The doodle poll will come out. I'm hoping for a last week of October selection, maybe an hour meeting. So trading the materials for reading outside of a meeting setting, and then focus on setting a November day, because that's really where the, the work will commence. Cascadia will take the lead. They're the primary under the contract. I'll be in attendance. I'll press go on Zoom uh, and then help out as needed. But they're really going to develop the program, the pace, timelines. Uh, we know what they are. It's the scope. Uh, and so December, January is the greenhouse gas sub-element, inventory, things like that that need to take place early. And their, their um, team is set to do so. Keep the that whole task force in form while we're keeping the planning commission in form because the tool or the project is the comp plan amendment, the 2025 voluntary docketing amendment, which has to come to the whole commission, get a recommendation, just like the periodic update, and then go to city council. And we have the $500,000 commerce grant and we have one more visitor and we'll see what it is. Um, that has the scope of work that's reflected in the scope of work approved in the Cascadia contract. Mm -hmm. And so those have, will carry through and uh, Cascadia's test between June with a deliverable for the grant that consists of a review draft of the complement amendment and then city council and Cascadia through the summer and fall. So the planning commission is anticipated in the spring. Spring. Yeah. So is there a point person from Cascadia now? There there is. Uh, uh Gretchen Moeller. Gretchen Moeller. Yeah, I keep wanting to pronounce it Mueller, but it's Moeller. So I've learned that. Uh, Gretchen and then uh Alexander Doty is the day-to-day. -day. And you'll see emails from both of them. Looks like Yanni has his hand drags. Hey Yanni. Oh. Hey there, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, I was just going to make just an editorial comment. I've just in my day job, I've worked with both Gretchen and Alexandra on some things in the past, and they're both really solid. Uh, they, I think they'll take good care of us. So I'm very optimistic for that team. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So we have public hearings on the list here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just leave it for structure in Zoom. Okay. If there's no words after it, assume NA. Yeah, that okay. keeps the clerk happy. Great. And we're not accepting online public comments. So the person that. Do we have any written comments? Do we have any written? Uh, comments? We have no written comments okay. <laughs> of any. Good catch. <laughs> of any sort. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll pass it over to our city liaison, city council yeah. liaison. Thank you. Good to be here. Sorry, I missed you last week. And um, I got my notes very kind of small, so I'll try and keep it. A lot has happened since um, we all met in the first part of Actually, it was it? So on September 12th, we received the mayor's uh, preliminary proposal uh, biennial budget for six. And we've spent a lot of meetings uh, both reviewing the revenue. Uh, projected for the next biennium, as well as reviewing uh, expenditures projected for each of the departments, as well as uh, looking at requests from various departments that they may have, whether it be municipal court uh, with the additional um, traffic cameras, there's an additional one. So there's a request to have additional staff to help process that. And the same thing with the police department. Um, with the additional cameras, they do come with restricted um, expenditures. So even though cameras typically go into the general fund, there will be a separate general fund that's dedicated for a certain number of cameras associated with changes of the RCW's laws about how those monies can be spent. They're anticipated to generate uh, about $4 million per year. Nice. And the expenditures of those um, are restricted. Um, they may be... Um, spent on the administrative costs of having the cameras. So you have to pay to maintain the cameras every month, as well as the processing of the tickets to go with them or the uh, 
court municipal court as well as the police officer who have to review the agenda. Um, but the council will have to sit down and decide how to spend the remainder of those funds. And they are intended for uh, safety improvements for traffic that have multi multimodal needs of travel. So we'll need to sit down and figure out how to spend them because they will be restored. So would it be four million? Is what that's not including the expenses, right? That's not including the expenses. So How the much net, do you think? Net. The net is when you put two point seven to three million wow. per year. Wow, that's very significant. But they are restricted um, because on the other side, the general fund pays for things like courts, public works, and police. Police are the largest expenditure for the city of Lake Forest Park, and this uh, come out of the general fund. And we are projecting a three million dollar deficit in the general fund. Now there are other funds that are used to pay for certain activities in the city, such as the uh, sewer, surface water, uh, and roads. They have in some cases their own individual funds. Where so, when you pay your sewer bill, a portion of that goes to the city of Lake Forest Park. Much of it goes to the county to process the sewage that goes to the county. So they have dedicated sources for certain. But police comes out of California. So we are looking at how to address that imbalance. We currently have enough in our reserves to accommodate the three million dollar deficit that we have in the general fund over the next five years. But we do need to consider how we're going to manage that going forward because it is increasing deficit. In the last five years, we had about a million dollar deficit for the two years. Now, certain things accrued, um, so we actually ended up with reserves at the end of 2024 projected to be more than what we projected when we established the budget two years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's a positive. Some some of the money is accrued because we had vacancies. So where you wish you had the staff, uh, the flip side is you accrued the reserves because you weren't in the staff that you wish you had. Mm -hmm. so, your advantages and disadvantages over it. So we are looking at um, a possible levy lift. So we are entering discussions to hire a consultant to help us identify what the levy lift might be to help pay for some of the core services that we force from as such as police support. We've also initiated a contract with a consultant firm, um, Liz Loomis, uh, to do some polling survey work to understand what the citizens of Lake First Park either know about our budget situation or where they might be that they might want to increase um, funds to accommodate some of our core services. So that's an important piece to generate before we actually decide what kind of level that we want to do. And that will occur primarily um, the survey work will be uh, maybe late this uh, fourth quarter or early next uh, probably late this quarter. And then we'll work with the levy consultant to figure out how we might approach your relevant Questions? No, I mean, we're just so largely single family. I mean, it, it's really a fraction of that 1%. I mean, it's like. So the 1% yeah. turns out to be about $34,000 per year. So it's not a lot of money. Yeah, I'm hoping there's another proposition that will be put out know, to vote for, for people to increase that. So our fund sources are property tax, sales tax, um, real estate excess tax. So we can sell property and he's going to support some road efforts. And then we have taxes or fees associated with uh, service water and then sewers. Sounds like we need to get more cameras. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there are options to put in a couple more cameras, but they did like uh, the ones that we've just recently initiated around Brookside, which are 24 7. They are restricted. So the funds for those have to go to travel safety administrator, unless they can't go to travel. So there are some limitations there. Uh, Would sidewalks fall under that? Category, yes. So, this would fund safe streets effectively. It would effectively uh, an opportunity to fund safe streets. 
<laughs> and we want to assess is that the same priorities that we have established when we develop the consultant program for safe streets and, and the projects that we put out. So we'll be reviewing that and say, okay, we do want to stay with that priority list or want to do something different. That's what we have. Um, you may have seen that we signed the uh, purchase and sale, or we authorized the mayor to sign the purchase and sale agreement for what is known as the Rose property adjacent to the five acre woods. So that sale has actually gone through. So um, that property will revert to the uh, city when Curtis Rose passes away. Oh, we had a presentation on what we call active transportation. That's primarily uh, street overlay as well as uh, safety to go with it. We also had a discussion about multimodal uh, activities or healthy streets. So opportunities, for example, to uh, slow traffic on streets that might lead through um, signage or placards that say it's the healthy street, slow down. So that is still in the works. We also heard about um, a proposal to debt finance um, some of the vehicles that we need, for example, for the police department and public works. We have some vehicles that are very old or basically beyond their effective life. Uh, police cars, for example, 100,000 years. We have vehicles that are much older than that. And it's, it's a trade off between maintenance costs and uh, vehicle costs. And coming up tomorrow, we have more discussion about our biennial budget as well as the labor force department comprehensive plan. This discussion. And then in our regular meeting, we have a discussion about uh, whether we should take a position on uh, state initiative 2066 concerning regula regulating energy services, including natural gas and oil. That so will be in discussion tomorrow. Related or for the vehicle emissions, um, is there any discussion about replacing the EVs? There are some discussions about that. Um, we have, I think, signed a contract with the Department of Commerce to help us with uh, developing EV charging permits. I just remember that was, I think, in the climate. Yeah, Sarah had mentioned that too. Oh, so, one of the things that we are going to consider is um, has the technology got to the point where we want to have in police cars? They're very special on this I mean, you guys buy them second hand, don't you? We start the like, yeah, car. We buy new. Oh, we do? Yes, yeah, because their useful life is only about six years or 100,000. Yeah. So we buy a useful one. Sure. And they're very expensive. To totally outfit a police car is about $80,000 per year. Mm -hmm. So it's about 40000 for the car and then another 40000 to have to be able to go to the city. Pretty happy. Are there any updates on an associate planner, or is that still senior planner? Or yeah, senior planner. <laughs> we have a conditional offer. Qualified person needs to relocate. We're working towards a final offer and a start date. And, so, building this. and as part of our budget process, it's not in the mayor's proposal, but there was a discussion about you know, either part time or full time employment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Sorry about middle housing. 9A, middle housing. The, the third number one priority effort we have. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for the recording, basic background: we're we're nearing completion of review of our required periodic update of all the elements, policy level document, comprehensive plan, with the goal of December adoption to meet the Growth Management Act deadline. We have the Commerce Grant to do the climate element four years in advance. 
the contracts in place, that'll last through 2025. A more timeline sensitive issue is that third effort. It's the development regulations around some of the, the already work that's already happened, but we injected policy into the complex. Now the development regulations that apply to specific project proposals and property are the tasks that we're starting tonight. <laughs> the time sensitivity is that that can't just be in draft form with the recommendation and hand it off to city council in June and see where we, we get 2025 because on, in theory, July 1st, 2025, if we haven't adopted local regulations, we are subject to a model ordinance adopted, put in place by Department of Commerce, um, which is meant to address all the issues for similar cities. We would offer that this effort should take precedence, put local development regulations in place and have them adopted by June of 2025. So we are not subject to the model ordinance. Um, a lot of the policy level work has been done. Uh, you've spent a year with visioning, a year with the policy. You understand the housing needs assessment and so forth, the growth targets, how um, with those policy changes and these development codes, what are we trying to address? And so you've seen a table from staff and Lila that shows the, the planning period through 2044, the growth target of 870 units of various types. If, if nothing is done at the policy level and development regulation level, and we go with uh, the standards we have in place right now, most of that growth target will be met, but not all of it. So there is work to be done with middle housing, done the policy work. Now the discussion of housing types, development regulations, what is appropriate for the community of Lake Forest Park in balance with other high priorities on critical areas, uh, shoreline, uh, and find a way to address about uh, 275 units of growth target is not that is not accounted for in our addition our existing policy and regulations. We have the capacity to provide more than a thousand in addition. So it's not a capacity issue. Um, but the task at hand is how will we address the middle housing mandates in our development code adopted by ordinance by June 2025. And tonight is just meant to be a kickoff, meet new staff, get a general presentation, have a discussion on what may be needed, what you'd like to see, um, and getting going. It would inform SCJ as they marshal um, their staff in and begin that process. Hope that gives an umbrella overview okay. and conveys the urgency. That's great. Thank you. Can I ask one procedural question? Maybe it's to Zoe, but um, as we move through this, uh, will the middle housing um, code recommendations that we make be, how will those impact our single family housing code? Like what's the connection between the two? Like if we, if we, reduce or increase setbacks, you know, to one, do we, have to, do we have to do for one what we do for the other? So I actually have a PowerPoint that has a point on that exact bit. Um, and I will state that per the state legislation that passed, they want single family and middle housing to be treated similarly um, together. With that, and that middle housing development code cannot be more restrictive than single family. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, other events have happened in addition <laughs> to the comp plan. We had the community housing forum, uh, and with the comp plan workshop, uh, and trying to maximize outreach so that it would benefit this effort. A lot of the technical aspects. Difference between an eight foot and a 10 foot side yard setback is not going to come from staff, um, but would be uh, relayed to you so that you understand the mechanics of what a 
made me. One of the primary items of feedback we've been getting is what this effort is not. It is not an effort to take a single family bulk on a single family lot, multiply it by three, blow down the critical areas, call it good. The bulk and mass stays that single family. But then generally would consist of ADUs, duplex, triplex, even cottage in that bulk and mass and preservation of critical areas. So that's what mass has. Um, I think last we discussed about limiting this to a couple zones. Uh, our, I want to say it's R R seventy two hundred R S seventy two hundred or the previously known R S seventy two hundred and R S fifteen thousand. Is that still in the the it, works, or are we now looking at globally? Because I thought during the call plan process we get zero. That I don't know if anybody else. We're, we're heading towards that, but yeah. the important part about this effort is the discussion. Um, how you know and discuss it broad. Step back in line. Exactly. Okay. What is middle housing? What is appropriate? What and then narrow it to what is appropriate for Lake Forest Park. But okay. the discussion has to happen, including housing types of six, seven, eight types, some of which may not be appropriate for here. Okay, so we're we're really zeroing back again yeah. further. So we don't even know if it's gonna be a true ordinance or an amendment to an existing code. Well, the the, uh, the policy in theory is captured in this periodic update. The development regulations will be an ordinance in our municipal code. Okay. So that's the goal. We have an additional advantage. I don't know if you read the article this weekend in Shoreline News about our complaint <laughs> being late. Had they called staff, we have a unique opportunity that whatever, and I see Yanni has a question mark, whatever policy we have not incorporated into the periodic update, but that may rise later and need amending, adding, or we just got it wrong, take it away. All those get lumped into the climate element amendment. You can do one amendment, but it can be a hundred things. And so that's our second opportunity to make sure we got housing policy right. Uh, if we did, and it's in the comp plan right now and it's adopted, all we're doing is development regulations. Municipal code. Oh, thanks. That's the primary difference between the last two years. So basically, the yeah. you, they 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 Oliver didn't call you for a it read like he did it. <laughs> yes, Yanni. Yeah, uh, two questions. Um, just to clarify, though, there are there's the minimum of allowing two units that will apply everywhere. Right. So that's I mean, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the other housing types, we talked about zones, but state law is going to tell us that we need to allow to in our single family zones. So, okay. So I remembered that right. The other question, and I, I think I know the answer here, but there are some other aspects of our current development code very much related to housing and density and things. Uh, maybe not uh, explicitly about middle housing, but I'm assuming, Mark, that if we know of some things we want to address, we we can lump those in as well, or work on them if we, you know, want yeah. to. Yeah, there there will be one ordinance. We have to be mindful of the timeline, the deadline for the model ordinance, but that opportunity is there, and we can start it by talking broad. We're primarily trying to meet the mandates of three pieces of legislation in various sessions. I'll get the numbers wrong, 1220, 1337, and 1110. So we'll at least do that. A lot of the first two are accessory dwelling units, ETAS accessory dwelling units. So we will look at that. Middle housing in House Bill 1110 looks at more types, duplex, triplex, quadplex. So we will do all that if we run into an inconsistency or just some other uh, fix it issue that can be in this ordinance as long as it doesn't sidetrack us from June. Okay, just for the record, it's one I've brought up before, and I think I had it in some of the comments in our in our draft comp plan. Uh, the one I'm thinking about specifically is the kind of goofy frontage re requirement we have on 
lots in the RS, uh, what, 20 and 15 and 10,000, which requires a certain amount of public street frontage to make a lot, which basically it's an, it was an artificial tool to keep even the biggest lots from subdividing, even to what the zoning allows. I think it's a, it's a, I'd like us to talk about that. Let I'll, I'll stop there, but I think we should talk about that because it's, there's an agenda behind it from way back and it's totally inconsistent with this idea that we need to have some more housing and housing types. Thanks. On the back burner, right? Or on the burner? Maybe not back. I, I would offer it's on the burner because it's part of that discussion we're going to have anyway. Right. But if it gets us sidetracked into numbers and away from the house bill mandates. Right. But shouldn't we be talking about procedure first? Like, I'd like to know like what the consultant's thinking in terms of how yeah. we're going to approach this. What are the big questions that then the yeah. ask you tonight, back burner. Tonight, yeah. Uh, yes. I, I, I would love for us though to come back to it so that we can have a proper discussion. But I agree. I think it would be good to hear from Zoe now. But I have, I have a couple other thoughts. Yeah, thoughts on that. Maybe we can I, carve out ten fifteen minutes of the meeting to just really yeah throw out all of our ideas. Sorry, Zoe. Okay, awesome. I do have a PowerPoint that's prepped and actually was addressing the legislation that was stated earlier. So part of me was just like, oh, I should share my screen already, but I'll do the formalities and let's hope that my screen sharing will work correctly. This is always the struggle with this. Uh, I know it's a blank screen right now, so hopefully from the beginning can okay. folks see it. Yay, yeah. awesome, perfect. So hi everybody, Zoe Tapert. My name sometimes looks like Tapert, but it's Tape. Um, we'll be talking about mental housing today. So I know that the SCJ Alliance team helped with the comp plan as well. I was actually pulled in near the final bits just as extra hands to help review some things real quick. Um, but for the middle housing update specifically, it'll be a project team of Kirsten Peterson, who unfortunately could not make it tonight. Myself as a planner doing production work, really getting into the nitty bitty details of the code, as well as Sharifa, who's really great with our development regulations, as well as showing, as well as showing the visual side of codes and everything. Um, for background on myself, I am from Whidbey Island originally. I saw a kiddo earlier in the room, and I want to say that I was brought to Parks Commission and Port Commission meetings at a young age, and my parents are pretty sure that's why I'm in planning now. I joked and went the environmental nonprofit route for a period of time, but found that I loved policy and got my degree in environmental ethics and policy, and then later got my master's in community and regional planning, joined SCJ, and have been loving just this nitty gritty policy work ever since, especially with code. So happy to be here and thank you all for having us. Uh, the state legislation refresher, this is the three bits here. Um, now HB 1110 is kind of lumped with this amendment that happened in the last legislative session. That was HB 2321. It just changed a little bit of the language. It's still the same idea of requiring an allowance of different middle housing types based on a city's population and that these regulations need to conform to requirements within six months after a city's periodic update due date. HB 1220 was the amendment to the housing element within the GMA, and that was accounting for the income bans and identifying and addressing local policies that result in racially disparate impacts. And then 1337 is the ADU bill, as discussed, and this is one that doesn't deal with uh, population size in the same way that 1110 does and those middle housing areas. As a middle housing refresher, these are the nine middle housing types on the right that the uh, that Commerce has given folks to choose from. 
It's basically any sort of building that is compatible in scale, form, and character to single family, but is more than a single residence, so it's two or more, and it can come in a variety of different shapes, designs, sizes, and that cities really have to allow for different types based on their population size. And again, that middle housing regulations cannot be more restrictive than for those attached for detached single family residences. The population size component that I keep mentioning has to do with the tier system for cities. So it's gonna vary across the board. Of course, Seattle's gonna handle middle housing in a different way than Shoreline versus Lake Forest Park. And here at Lake Forest Park, we're dealing with that cities must permit at least two homes per residential lot. And that's like the bare minimum of what needs to be done here. So, as of like this summer in July, the ordinance actually changed. It used to be that for tier three cities, you had to do at least four of the nine middle housing types. And right now it is at least duplexes. So that's a major change there. Um, instead of having to select from that whole list of like the different types, it's at least duplexes and you can do other types depending on the community. Did also do some digging in preparation for this meeting. I know I wasn't involved in the public engagement that we helped with during the comp plan, but I wanted to refresh some of the results that were done because there was a deliberate e effort done to also understand what middle housing types folks in the community wanted to see. And the top three were cottage court, then ADUs and duplex. We really have to do ADUs and duplexes based on 1337 and the middle housing legislation alone. So I would say a conversation then is around the cottage court, which the wording of which in the engagement was a group of six or so, a group of six or so small detached house scaled buildings, typically up to one and a half stories in height arranged in a courtyard. And that's actually kind of a bit of a blend between courtyard apartments and cottage housing because courtyard apartments are attached together in a courtyard shape. Um, but that can be addressed however we would want to if that's still the way folks want to go. And then the least popular were tiny house villages, multiplex apartments, and then micro apartment buildings. Our approach for uh, adjusting development regulations for this is to really start with identifying the gaps in current code of just what needs to be addressed based on the state model ordinance alone and work with identifying gaps, updating definitions. This is stuff we have to do anyway, then utilizing visuals to help describe different regulations, get more into the customization of updating design standards and work off of that to have an edited version that folks feel good with. So that next step would be the gap analysis, which looks a little like this in draft form, where we do a comprehensive review of the current existing development code, highlighting areas where changes are needed. Yes, possibly no. Um, have recommendations associated with it, notes, hand that off all to you all for review, and then go about making those changes, customization to it, uh, moving forward from there. Um, but that is really what I had prepped for you all. Of course, I'm open to a conversation and can answer any sort of questions you have. So let me stop the share. That's my little spiel. So, oh no, um, are there any local cities that have already passed or have, have advanced in their development of their ordinance or? There are, I have not been involved in those projects necessarily, um, but there are some that have gone about it because other cities did receive grants to do this earlier. Um, don't have a list off the top of my head, but we can look at those. Is it Tom? I mean, Tom, Water. Tom Waters listed here. Is Tom Water is there as a, like a work in progress where we're at now. Yes. Yeah, no. So that's a city we're currently working with. Yeah. Oh, 
I have a question. Or were you done? Oh, cool. Sam, yeah. um, Sam, I think you were next. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask if you have or will be sharing kind of a proposed timeline of like our work plan, like what should we be doing each month and to be set to pass by end of June and leaving the council enough time to consider whatever we propose and have public hearing and the rest of it. That's a good point. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You will or you already have that? Um, we already have it in the sense of the $50,000 grant and deliverables and that scope. We have it with the contract amendment through SCJ and that scope. Then we had periodic update to city council, a little transition in staff introduction tonight, and then circled back to um, what that timeline is. But we already know November, December, January are key. Right. Because I, I think, think what we're asking, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I think what we're asking, Bill, is what's the timeline for this committee, right? The, you're talking about big picture, yeah. But I, I think it would be useful, like what you're saying, to know what we need to accomplish yeah. in each meeting. Yeah, that and have I, to have extra meetings. With. Oh, so then I think you know if there's any areas where we can find some extra space. Because it sounds like this group, like we have a couple of things that we want to add in too. So if we could visually see like kind of where we're at, what we need to do, and if we can build some room for okay. this group to discuss. That's I'm, I'm hoping for the regular meetings through the winter, and and leaving it to SCJ. Um, and their new staff manager uh, dust that off, finalize it, get, and get what they need. They'll do the brown of the work and hopefully use your regular meetings and then work with them to make sure I count back from June and council meetings, three touches, so that we can have a draft ordinance and a path that we do environmental review. 60 day letter to commerce and council. So I know that I can't do months back. April, May, June is that period. So if we address that uh, question with SCJ and they come forward with what they need and when and inform you, and hopefully that's regular meetings, it takes us through February, March. That is the overall picture. We just don't have it tonight. So it sounds like SJG will SJC will develop a, a timeline, a work a work timeline for the planning. Business. Yes, that's in progress to develop a timeline um, that works with this group and what we'd be bringing for you all and vice versa. Okay. Um, can I get your question? Yeah. Um, and I have one comment. First comment, based on your last meeting, and so we talked about like having a Saturday session or whatever. I'm thinking it might take like a workshop environment where we can chew on things together because I think there have been so many really great ideas that have been sort of incidentally, you know, thrown out that we may need some space to actually just have wild ideas, you know, and away from the consultant, you know, so that we can just talk amongst ourselves and plan just as an idea. So wait, you're smiling. Yeah, and I, no, just, I, I think that's great. Yeah. Um, just to take everything we're learning from you and then have some brainstorming sessions and then come back to you with some organized questions versus just sort of ad hoc. Perfect. No, that okay. works with us. Okay, two questions. One, um, back to my original question, I think what I was asking them, I knew it, we couldn't have something more restrictive for like duplexes and single family houses, but I was asking that in the other way. Like if we say, you know, Okay, so a duplex, if you're building a duplex, you're allowed this perceived benefit that you don't get when you have a single family house. So do we have to allow single family homes to have all the same benefits of a duplex? I don't think so, actually. I don't think there's a restriction in that. It's like you have to treat them fully the same. Like, I think you could do more incentives for middle housing. I haven't actually seen that come up though. I would not see anybody having an issue with it though. Yeah, I, I just wondered if we have to treat duplexes the same as single family houses, will single family houses say, you know, not that single family houses talk, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Kind of, anyway, the other is kind of a use case. Um, what's not clear in the law to me is uh, if, you're building a duplex on a property here in Lake Forest Park. Are you still allowed a DADU and an ADU? So in effect, you could build six units on a property 
or what's the intersection between the ADU law and the duplex, the middle housing? So, yes, you in theory, and I'm going to say in theory right now, not taking into consideration like critical area, septage capacity, I mean, sewer connection lines, any other thing, fire code, all of that other side. In theory, you can have a duplex building and ADUs, in theory. How the capacity and other demands on the system work with that would vary through development. So I, I see a point. I also know that's not like a, a great answer because it's something we'll need the bottom up because when we updated our EDU code, I don't know, two years ago, we uh, wrote in our, our current code says you can have a DADU and an ADU. It's got some floor area restrictions and so forth and setbacks. But under current, uh, under our current uh, building code, you can have two and to the point where we can't be more restrictive of middle housing than single family housing. I mean, I guess theoretically, uh, each duplex could then build two units, which would amount to six units on a property. And so I just, I think it's some, it's going to be something that we have to resolve and understand so that when we're weighing the implications of all of the other aspects that we have a clear picture. Yeah, that's where it gets into the specifics a bit on the lot sizes, because yes, like, with it being treated the same as single family, you would be able to do do I mean to do ADUs in that way. Um, it, it gets messy with the review. Um, but that's just my comment there. Of I'll have to do a bit more digging on it, but you could have those six units on a lot in less in certain less. cases change the legacy ADU code that was updated a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we'll have to know that. And then can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. um, it looked like in the slides that you just showed that there were some guidelines on siting of DAD units where it looked like real specific egress was required to the DADU. And I don't think that's in our current code. And so are there specific mandates that we should be aware of with regard to access to the ADUs that we'll need to update in our code. I that believe, it? okay, wait, let me share my screen again on this. Um, was it on this slide here with the visuals the or was left. it? The image on the top left, do you see the, it's- Yeah, this one. This was meant as more of an example of what we can produce for showing the, just showing code in general for you all of different scenarios for how code turns into the visual aspect. Um, when it comes to the requirements on these, there are certain guidelines to make sure that we're following. Part of that for middle housing is in the ordinances. And then for 1337, there's language there as well that I personally have not messed around too much with yet, um, but we will be reviewing as part of this. And I'm asking that question just to the rest of you, uh, because one of the things we learned was that there was, there was interest at the legislative level to be able to sell a DABU, and that legislation didn't pass, but the thought was that that might be farther down the line. And I don't know if that creates a challenge. So I'm just thinking that if if that's the way, you know, the legislation goes, are are, are we going to need to update our ADU code to acknowledge that it is suitable for that type of usage? Mm -hmm. So we don't have all the words to explain my thinking properly, as much as to say, how can we anticipate future? So I think that's a really good point. And I think that we so I'm wondering. You know, we're already starting to have this conversation about how are we going to track those questions, right? How do we make sure that we come back to those questions? Because I'm concerned about, given, you know, like with the comp plan, we just got so inundated with information that I think we, we left some things out. So what's the process of collecting that, those questions? I was going to say, I am taking notes at this moment on okay. my little notepad over here. 
um, and I can type things up for everybody. Um, but having any sort of running list, I think is helpful to make sure that we capture the ideas and nothing gets lost in the process. So. Is that rely on you for sometimes our consistency with members in and out you know, it can get lost. So can, are you something that can own that or do you need us to do that? I would feel better with you all owning it. One of the members in the room having a, a tracking of notes. I mean, we can share on our end, but I could not necessarily say if I'm going to always be a bit available to attend these meetings is part of the thing. I know Kirsten might step in more than myself. That would be great. Yeah. I, I, just, just, like, just like the annotated, I would suggest get your comments and questions as you get them, filter them through the chair and vice chair, and then we'll build that running list. Is that Make something sure. that's better for you to do so that you have administrative control over the? No, I don't have the bandwidth. Okay. I, mean, uh, I can bring my, I can volunteer to start yeah. and get the hearing out so if you guys want that way. I'll start bringing my computer and I can start talking. I, I just want to make sure they exist yeah. without detracting from comp plan, climate element, yeah. or any two other projects that I'm doing. Um, so I think that's a good question, but I, you know, I don't know. I think it's important to look at the DADU code so that there is consistency. And I don't know who's, uh, it seems to me, SJs, that would be within their wheelhouse. But again, I don't. The, the gap person. analysis and what's in there right now. Correct. The, if that, the that will happen. And then ADUs and uh, a review of 1220 and 1337. I've been preoccupied for this year. <laughs> I'm convinced that in those house bills, you can sell an ADM. I know that you don't have, have to have it owner occupied anymore. And so we'll meet those mandates, whatever they are, talk about everything else, but it may be that you didn't bought subdivision and so forth. It's on the table right now. There was I'm some term. Sorry, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I was just, Maddie. I was trying to get some clarification on terminology. You were using the acronym DAD. What is DAD? Detached. Accessory. Okay. So our current code allows one attached accessory dwelling unit within your structure, and one DAD. Detached. detached. Got it. Yeah. Right. Um, so. We did so much work on that stuff. We did, and I I think too. And I'll just I'll just type my questions in here and then pass it out to you guys and if everyone wants to add theirs and you can put it in the notes uh, for public access. But uh, you want to be the clear, uh, can we just have one person be the clearinghouse? That way, if if as, do you want to be the clearinghouse, we can send you uh, that or that or like I said, I was just going to do little sheets and then everybody has access. Oh, perfect. To it. Yeah, and so people can type their own. In. Uh, so I'm curious about uh, process. I mean, whether to us or to, to Zoe, as we entertain uh, a lot of the ideas that we kicked around, and, you know, should we allow in certain zones, you know, this type of housing versus that type of housing, what process we'll use to sort of play out the, um, to, to test our ideas, you know, like what, what might this, what might the impacts be environmentally? What might the impacts be in terms of, uh, access or fire code or like all of the things so it's not just we don't get just enamored with the housing idea without thinking about what the downstream impacts are of that kind of housing you know on a on a right the unintended consequences unintended consequences we said it more eloquently. yeah what process will we use to, to try to weigh the unintended consequences as a for example our current code allows uh, a, somebody who's developing a lot to be, they have to be a total of 15 feet, the side yard setback. You can be as close as five feet on one side, which is pretty close when you think about trying to like paint or do siding projects or whatever. But um, without touching that, uh, we don't have anything that limits any step back for second floors or limits the linear feet you could run along somebody's uh, fence line. And I highly encourage you all to drive down to Grace Cole. And just before you get to Grace Cole, there's a house on the right that sold this lot that was in back the three parcels. They sold it back and the person built a house that runs the length of their fence in order to preserve a ginormous yard for themselves on the other side. And it's the sheer wall that comes up and looms over this other house because they weren't restricted on the linear feet, nor did they have to do setbacks. 
and all during construction because they couldn't build the house on five feet of property. They just wrecked the, the person's, you know, landscape. Unintended consequence of a five foot setback. Um, so I would love for us to think about how we might test our ideas so we don't just get swept up with a housing idea and not think about how it might play out. Uh, I'll, uh, staff can offer two categories to focus on so that the whole burden is not everywhere. Trees and critical areas. You know what the code is, you know how to implement it. You have Drew for trees, you have me for critical areas. The intent is to meet the mandates, provide mental housing, take use, and so forth, and whatever the community chooses, but not negatively affect trees and, and critical areas. So we can take those two lenses and ensure uh, the conversation doesn't have the unintended consequences for those. One of, one of the concerns I have for unintended consequences actually with this stuff, with all this is um, we don't have enough, we're, we're struggling for planning service, like the civil services for the city to pay for this. And nowhere is there discussion as to if we're gonna add more density, then there's gonna be more need for policing, for planning, for public works, sewage, and that, that there's a gap there that I would like also to kind of kind of think about <laughs> that has me concerned. So that should go on a Google list. On a Google list, yeah. yeah. And we may already have information and in past efforts that address that, the capacity and show those exhibits, but um, have that conversation. Yeah, I, I feel very strongly that we can't look at that in isolation. It's kind of the frustrating thing about this legislation for a city of our niche, you know, where we are so funding strapped, mm -hmm. um, but we're about to exasperate even further with this legislation, more of those services. And, and it's, yeah, anyways, just wanted to raise that also as right. unintended consequences. And so I guess yes, it raises a, oh, sorry. Oh, it I was just saying, that's a good point. It raises a question because it's a great point, Melissa. And as we're having these conversations and discussions, I think who would be on point then to kind of inform us, like the parameters of this legislation? Because I thought I remembered something in one of the bills that even said, like, you can't in accommodating this middle housing, you know, put any sort of burden on the people who want to develop it to support increases in infrastructure even if it's putting a strain on the infrastructure yeah, but I mean, so like, fiscally it's just you know on the one hand we're so constrained by this but on the other hand you know we're financially unable to support <laughs> more of this load so as what we're discussing yeah. and coming up with ideas Zoe would that be you to kind of help keep us true to what the law requires and where yeah. limits are okay absolutely perfect. yeah like and I will make a note that this is something I've even kind of needed to get more into the weeds of and seeing how it plays out in other folks' example of the regulation. But there is a part of HB 1110 and in the amendment that was made in 2321, where it says that, yes, middle housing and single family are to be treated similarly, the exception being critical areas. So that is an area that they have separated out to avoid any impacts there. The specifics of that, I'm still diving into understanding in what cases, but there is legislation writing there. Yeah, I'd like to see an example. I would definitely like to see an example of it that being pushed, right? The, uh, when a critical burns comes into play, what's happened? I feel like the city of Normandy Park, the city of Des Moines, these are all kind of profile cities that are similar, not only with a lot of critical areas, but largely single family, under 25,000. I'd be curious to see if they, where they've gotten in terms of model units. And those, I think that you touched on something just a few seconds ago as well. It's like, you know, we have kind of, we have two goals, right? <laughs> One is middle housing. We know we got to do that. You know, people need yeah. to live someplace. We also have an environment. You know, the city of Lake Forest Park. It's citizens really appreciate the the quality of life that we have here with trees and the and the uh, you know that we're protecting the canopy. But 
at what point does that contradict? Do, the, do those goals contradict one another? And what do we do if it does contradict? That's another question. Uh, <laughs> what is uh, what happens with uh, lots completely encumbered by critical areas? What would reasonable use be? Now that the the next agenda item gives that option, will we will we be looking at all existing codes part of this effort with a middle housing token? Yes. Yeah. Will RUEs come up? Yes. But we also have a timeline. And so the next uh, item or the next agenda item is a laundry list of potential topics to address in 2025. And it may be that the RUE reload is good enough for middle housing, but is on a side burner for 2025 to be relooked at entirely. And so that discussion we could have. I guess the my underlying question there though is what were we'll, what does the state say about RUEs given all of this, these new housing laws? And what, what purview does our city have to determine what that is so that we don't discourage middle housing, but actually maybe use a, a reasonable use exemption yeah. to encourage two really small units versus a larger. And that'll come down to the language which hasn't changed. If the language is, um, prevents all economic benefit, an argument can be made on RUE standards as is, is sufficient. A single family home of some size through the RUE process is economic benefit. Could the property owner then argue, well, my neighbor gets two detached ADUs that they sold and a duplex, and they have a apartment above and a cottage housing next door. Why can't I get that as a minimum development run? That's where the, the language comes in. We want to avoid takings. We don't want to buy all the critical areas in the city. But oh, the, the language about deprivation of all economic benefit is key. Some cities don't have that. And it is an average comparison of, of vicinity and what those developments have. And as those go to duplexes, they're going to have to re-examine that because if a minimum development right then becomes duplex two ADUs and that goes to hearing examiner and that's what our language is, then yes, that's the minimum development right. Our language right now does not say that. It's pretty strong. But it will definitely be re-looked at. Because I know in the end, on July 4th, when we get applications, I'll need to implement the code. And if that question comes in with a building permit application, I'll need an answer. <laughs> um, you know, what constitutes that minimum development right in our code on that day? That, that'll be important. That, that's a good perspective. So what is it that you need to answer come July? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it may be that no change is needed uh -huh. or that it's side burner for a complete relook on how it's working. Uh -huh. We'll know what the existing language is. We'll have an opinion. We have access to, to Kim Pratt uh, for advice, frame a recommendation, and then continue that discussion. Are you staying high up there in this process? They can't, I would offer they can't be prevented, or you're going to lose in court. You're going to be buying these properties and paying for the development you're not allowing. So, a minimum development right. And an RUE are for tools, but then decide locally what that consists of. And they get legal advice and go forward. And that is a trick, but your question not to just to go back to the question how can we use RUE to our advantage? It's just I mean, I think all of it, uh, my my biggest worry is that all this middle housing is going to just create a whole lot more expensive housing in our feet. Our underlying my land is very expensive. Mm -hmm. it, it's just it's the nature of what's been created, and the, the the cost of the land makes building middle housing I think pretty complicated. And my biggest fear is all of this is not going to achieve the goal of creating middle housing. We're just going to have a lot of expensive housing in our feet. So 
I'm super interested in how we might all work together to figure out like what are the right sort of incentives, the things that would serve as that right tipping point to have somebody think like, oh yeah, I'd rather build this than that. So I mean it's maybe a workshop where we can talk more mm -hmm. freely and um, come up with those ideas. I think that's the dilemma between cities and developers. We can't control you know, what a developer decides and propose, like an owner of that property, that's really up to them. And there's no, unless we put like design ordinances or that sort of thing. And, but yeah, it's darn near impossible to control that. Right, but we can, I'm, I think between all of us, we might find some mechanisms to incentivize. That's the, like, I guess oh, that, that was my point. point. It's like, yeah, we can't control it. So the only way we can control it maybe is by incentivizing it. So what, what would those incentives look like? I think that's key because middle housing is not subsidized right. market rate, but it's meant to give variety of housing types that are missing. There's the keyword so that the market has more options at various income levels, um, but it's not intended to be subsidized, rent control, incentivized with density bonuses on the lower end. That's not. But it is middle ground. There, I use both words. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I go back to sidewalks. Um, we live in a park. It is, if you go out at any given day, you'll see the number of people walking and having to negotiate around those cars. But if we could have a connected thoroughfare, um, we are essentially, to answer your question, we live in a park and, and to actually offer our, our residents an ability to actually walk this park. Is, is truly um, a special thing. And um, so anyways, I, I think my answer is again, how do we tie in that, that you know, that the conflict? We can have middle housing. Um, people want to walk. Uh, we need to promote, I think, the sidewalks. I'm looking forward to the council's work, um, being able to constantly push that uh, without the residents not having to negotiate that, that we live in a park and that, yeah, it's exciting. To, to be able to walk to uh, a place where we can get coffee. Right now, there's only one in my neighborhood, local 104, <laughs> but I'm still hoping to for, you know, for more diverse uses for walkability. But that really is, um, you know, I think maintaining an incentive to maintain the trees, the canopy for all residents, because again, it is, uh, we live in a park. <laughs> any other items for middle housing or for our new leader Zoe I uh we, we had an internal meeting last week to kick this off like everything else tonight is just an introduction and we all are aware we need to hit the ground running I'm going to create a library I've read House Bill 1110 so many times during the session after the session the clean up bill I couldn't tell you what's really in there and which version I'm remembering. But I, my goal is to create a library of those things so that they are available to you and take it up, up on staff to verify that they're the most relevant, that are part of this effort. So I'll, I'll take that on as we go to November. And the SCJ staff that couldn't be here tonight is anticipated to be involved on November 12th. And a lot of the background work and factual information doesn't need to happen in a meeting. It's preparation so that we preserve the, the meeting time for discussion. We will we'll start developing that. So next time we'll have, I think we'll have a timeline. Is that is is that my understanding? And uh, some yes. clarity. I thought was clarity on the house bill though too, especially. It sounds like it's a constant meeting target. That was that's been our struggle as a group is is also trying to keep up with the changes. Yeah. And planners, at some point you've got to give up, right? That's they passed it. Some things made it in, some things didn't. Some things overlapped with trends and oriented development that was going to come back the next session. Then you read it and then you do the model ordinance with commerce. You think you understand it, but you keep hearing this, hey, they're going to do a cleanup bill. So don't take it as given. Then they do a cleanup bill. Half the stuff they intended to clean up didn't get done, but some did. And so for a tier three city with duplex, that really helped. The conflict in that regard was we need to adopt six types. 
but we only need to allow the densities for two. <laughs> you know, where does that leave implementation? So they, they clean that up as best possible. And then the next session comes and see where the, it goes from. But right now, I, I can't convey enough. If, if we've achieved one thing tonight, I'd be happy with um, some sense that we don't want to be subject to the model ordinance. <laughs> Everything kind of derives from there. And it's it's not intended to be this big bad thing. It's just not appropriate for this a city this size with critical areas and shoreline and so forth. It doesn't incorporate that. One. It just doesn't. Hundred percent. Yeah. I think I think if that is achieved tonight, we get the timeline. Um, I hope we have a quorum on November twelfth. But we'll share all the materials leading up to that. So whoever can't make it then would still anyway. So so real quickly, just back to this idea of a workshop for us all to get together and talk about you know, just amongst ourselves. Um are we thinking that would be after our next November meeting? Probably once we see their um Scheduled. Yeah. And you have to go get kids, right? I can see you like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you guys obviously keep, Yanni, are you able to take take control? I, I don't know if you're here when I explain. I have to take uh relieve the babysitter. Uh sorry. Yeah, glad to. Okay. Um I, I mean I think before as you guys transition in the next section of, of all the brainstorming that we had, obviously we have a really full agenda and maybe some of those items will parlay into what we're working on, but I think one of the last things that we left off was um, there was any guidance from city council. I think you're maybe going to bring it up the last time you guys connected, not that you didn't have anything to talk about, but if there was any additional direction or ideas that you wanted us to kind of kick around, but if not, we have a pretty healthy list already on the agenda for us to talk through. Um, I don't have anything to offer you tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's just fine. That's just fine. Um, Drinks. So I, if you guys want to talk about that, I will just listen to the rest of the recording and see what direction we might want to go. But between now and June, we have a pretty, pretty full time. So, um, okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks you guys. Thank you. Sorry to leave. Okay. And you those? Yes. Am I in trouble? No. <laughs> We're catching up on past minutes. You can take them with you for homework. <laughs> okay um didn't expect to share from the screen but i'll do my best and uh here we go um do we have more we need to to cover with S scj uh tonight or are we going to move on to our next bits i think I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. Go on that point, would folks like me to stay around in case any questions come up or pop off? Any preference? Um, I, mean, I, the, I think we're uh, keeping a list of our questions at this point that will definitely ping you and your team um, for those that we really need that level of kind of expertise. Some of these items you see on the list are kind of just things we want to talk about um, soon or convince the council to talk about and possibly work on um so i i mean that's my take mark what do you think uh, yeah i would never kick anyone out of a meeting i just don't think you would gain anything from it so sounds good that would be best to ask hope you all have a yeah. great rest of your evening thank you that's all to do with the work plan out. for next year good see ya thank bye. you bye I'll say I'm going to do my best here. I've, uh, the reason I stayed home is I've got a little bit of chest stuff going on. So pardon the, uh, if I cough, well, there you go. At least I'm not in the room with you. Um, so uh, I wasn't quite, I didn't really do any thinking about how to go through this, this uh, list. Um, Mark, any suggestions? I mean, I think some of these were kind of men mentioned at different times and for different reasons and in different ways. They were kind of flagged items that we felt like we wanted to put some, maybe put some energy into. I know there's at least one that I was was 
it's the one at the very bottom. It wasn't necessarily about planning commission. It was more about flagging for the city that there's some issues having to do with some, you know, surging use of roads like Perkins and whatnot. I'm not sure that's a planning commission job, but it was more about teeing up that item for and getting it to the right place. Um, so I don't know, Mark, do you have a suggestion how to go through these? Should we just kind of brief on each one of these and then um, figure out if it needs a different owner than the planning commission? Yeah, we could we could do that. My deliverable from doing this, what I need as staff to get out of this is your 2025 work plan. I need to bring that to city council. The intent of this list is to capture so we're not forgetting any, like a parking lot. So I guess the first test is, have we forgotten any? Is this the list? And then go through them and say, yeah, 2025 Planning Commission, or like the last item, uh, see if we can add it to active transportation, another ongoing effort elsewhere. And as I recall from the last meeting, this was like, to your point, Mark, this was our list of ideas of if we had nothing else to do after comp plan, what would we want to focus on? One of, one of the asks was, does city council have anything for us that they think is important for us to focus on? And it sounds like there's nothing burning there at this point. So we know we have the climate element that's going to be coming back at some point. We know we have what we were just talking about. So to me, it seems like the question is, in all of the time that we have here at the commission, is there anything else on this list that rises to the top? Because otherwise, it seems like it's an editing exercise. Because I think this is far too much for us to tackle. Well, and it doesn't include the own housing, right? Yeah, which yeah. is like half the year, right? Um, uh, at planning commission, yeah, the rest of this year, and at least three months in twenty twenty five. So there might be some areas here that are complementary to our middle housing conversation that we should address. That might be priorities. Exactly, what would be RUEs exactly? Yep. Yeah. So I guess I I guess I would say that um, we're really talking about what are we going to do after Q one, except for those items that are directly related to middle housing code, like RUEs. But so it's kind of getting a temperature read from the group. Which of these other things um, do we need to or do we want to tackle? Um, several of them are very much kind of comp plan type related, but so they might be things that we might want to work on in preparation for submitting them as part of an annual update or something like that, um, in, you know, in 2025 or 2026. Um, and some of these, I think we were wanting to learn, honestly, like some of these questions about why have we not seen the level of economic development in Southern Gateway as the plan that we wrote for that area was we imagined would would sort of trigger. So that to me is kind of more about learning. I'm not sure we even, you know, we're not ready to say, well, what does the answer need to look like? But it's like, what what's happening there? And I think that, that would be a really interesting and valuable discussion for us to have but it doesn't, it's not time constrained. I mean, middle housing and the things attached to it are what we must do right now. So why don't we just go through the list and determine what's related to middle housing that we want to address, such as reasonable, such as RUEs. We know that that's going to be part of that conversation. I mean, the climate element. The climate element, yeah. I think current code, I think there's some interest in looking at I think we should look at the building code. Just it, is there an opportunity to see, just get us all on the same page with the building code, revisiting some of these areas that I think mill housing touches upon. Not, not as I see the building code, that's state mandated. Yeah. If you mean development code, yes. Yeah, the development code, yeah, yeah. Not the building code, not like the must use this art, whatever installation. Yeah. No, sorry, the development code, uh, what, what, what the city has at this point in time, yeah, as a reference. Yeah, we, uh, without adding to this list, we will be doing that. It's one like purely example, not to re steer the discussion. Shoreline Master Program, 
we looked at in 2019, COVID hit, it died. Poised to go. Do we have to update it? Absolutely. Are we, did we miss the last round? Yes, we did. It's coming, but we need a contract. It needs to exist after these tier one efforts. Um, wireless code, sign code, sign code's already underway. Subdivision code. So they're not being forgotten, but they don't necessarily need to be added to this list. They're all examples of existing development codes that have not been touched for a long time. But I would say we'll get to them as we can. A lot of this staff originated at Shoreline and a consultant um, and not the same priority or need as a discussion about RUEs or discussion with that young job. So but, can I can I suggest we just try to bin these and sorry, I'm I'm listening the best I can. So I Sorry if I'm interrupting, but I just I'm trying to find a path forward here so we can knock this out. I thought I mean, there's a bin of these that are related to middle housing or have a nexus. That's priority one. So I think that's probably the the RUEs, the climate element, and existing I think those code. were the yeah existing existing code. Yeah, so those seem like priority one in that sense because of how they connect to middle housing then there are some things that and i'm just describing the bins here and we can then decide where things go um there are some things that we'd like we'd like to rest uh potentially um in the future after we get this middle housing body of work done there's also a category there's a couple of updates about things that other committees have worked on, tree canopy, the uh, parks plan, things like that, that those to me could be slotted in when it makes sense. I mean, yes, we want those, but those could be, you know, kind of a part of an agenda when we don't have, you know, a hard deadline on something like middle housing. And then lastly, there's kind of this category of things we want to flag for council, like, traffic safety given the new light rail station and how people drive on Perkins and 40th. Um, so, I mean, that's how I see this grouping of things. I don't know if anyone have a, want to do a better job than me of defining what the bins are. Uh oh, Sam, I'm going to visually put this down. Sam, Sam has been waiting to weigh in. No, I just had a question um, in that first bucket. And I like, I don't have a concern with the bucketing, Yanni, but for the first bucket, do we, Consider as adjacent to the middle housing code updates uh, a relook or a questioning of whether any changes to the design standards need to be in place. So the form and scale of middle housing that we're going to be permitting matches with kind of the character of the community to the extent that's a consideration. And Commerce does have a whole toolkit and set of guidelines uh, part and parcel with the middle housing that's for objective design standards. We don't have design standards for single family though. No, no, but we could. And so the legislation says if we don't have them for single family, you will not have them for middle housing. Right. But in yeah. this effort, you you can have them for both. Yeah. So it's a question of is that something we would want to consider as part and parcel or not? Yeah. Is is that the timeline too, roughly? So we're we're I feel like we're talking about wanting to come up with a, an agenda item for Jack, July, August, September, October, November, December. But then there's also a bunch of stuff related to the middle, middle housing that's due by Jack, June of 2025. Is that? Yeah. Well, it's due from us to council much earlier than that. So. Is that a different deadline then? So, uh, if you look at April, May, June as environmental review, commerce and city council, Middle housing needs to be pulled back to March. March, okay. That's wow. And that would be uh, November and March planning commission. So we're, we're still, boy, then we have a big gap here then. And then when does the addendum have to be? You'll, you'll be working on climate elements till June. That'll it's satisfy the June, grant. Yeah. But the contract runs through December, June or July to December, city council. That's but this for the planning commission that you get there. Yanni, I was thinking um, earlier when Councilmember Lebo was talking about uh, this money with cameras and so forth, and it, it being money that could find safe streets, maybe some of that uh, 
the traffic items that are on this list and what we've been talking about, maybe it makes sense for us to revisit safe streets and hold some public hearings and sort of check the recommendations in that. Are they Do they need to be added to or amended in any way? Could we help council out? I mean, if we're passing all this to them, they're gonna to be too busy to tackle it, I would guess. Can't speak on their behalf, but maybe it makes sense for us to spend the later summer and fall revisiting safe streets, especially if we've got revenue that's being generated, we need to have a, a good plan for how to spend it. I would, personally, I'd love to hear what the council thinks about that. Would they like to have us put time into that? I mean, I, I think it sounds smart. I, I don't argue with that at all. But is the time is the timing right? Would they would they find that valuable for their work to have us spend some amount of time on that? I I'm totally open to that. So isn't the process <laughs> that we pose a plan that's submitted to the council and then they determine whether or not they like that plan? So we can make that suggestion. And if you guys don't like it, you can say, right. uh, make some suggestions. So I would suggest that you do something like, as you talked about, the tiers. So sometimes uh, I create a public plan, but also describe the other things that you talked about. And um, the council may say, well, I'm glad you talked about that. You didn't put it on the plan, but I think you should work in it. So, um, the options. Can, can we maybe ask you to ask them? We're we're looking for something. To, we're kicking the tire. <laughs> looking for something. So I, if there's something they want us. I was going to gonna take this list and put it in front of the company. Yeah, perfect. That might give us. See, that's what I'm most comfortable with. Let's provide this. Do our brainstorming. Let's provide that list. Send so it to council. It will work both ways, and that um, you know, I I don't know the council's going to go. Oh, okay. Let's pick these. Uh, three things that we think the planning commission should work on. I think it should be a discussion uh, because it works best when you have a strong interest in stuff in something, because then the product that you develop is a result of that interest in action. It's a little harder when we say, "Oh, well, I'd like you to work on sewers." Also, yeah. right. it's a matter of can they fund like shoreline uh, the. Master plan was on our list for I think three years in a row, and the city didn't have bandwidth or the consultant. You know, so there may be some things that the city can't put together because of staff time or, or yeah. available funding. But, you know, we can't work on something where we don't have an expert uh, where an experts needed. So I think that's part of that calculus too. I, I just think it would be such a missed opportunity. We've got all these volunteers, and for you as well, like if there's something that we could do to help. Um, yeah, so, just so it's both ways. really want, yeah. Um, it, it works best when you have a strong interest in something, mm -hmm. yeah. and as a volunteer, it's more meaningful. So, as a matter of fact, understanding we, what you're interested in. So, when we did, we said actually, this list came out of brainstorming that we did together, and there was a lot of energy, a lot of excitement about economic development. I don't know if y'all remember that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there, you know, we had a lot of conversation about that. Um, that was probably one of the most. I think that's interesting, David, because it kind of goes to what Yanni was saying when he was trying to bend these topics. It it kind of goes with the Southern Gateway, like why haven't we seen some of the development exactly. that we thought? And then the question for economic development is this sort of feasibility. How feasible is it? For us to rezone areas to allow more commercial development in our community, manufacturing critical areas, and you know, all the things that I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But um, it 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 is it does fit nicely in that bin, uh, Yoni. I think that that um, information gathering, uh, almost like a landscape study of key issues that we have passion around. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I echo the economic development one. I mean, we've talked about it so much here mm -hmm. and what, you know, some fact finding, some exploration. And I remember as well, the survey results that we did, that was one of the key themes that came through. People wanted more kind of form and scale of neighborhood surveying, you know, commercial, right. you know, and we talk about the coffee shop, they're going away. Like, I mean, they're gone because they couldn't find a place here in right. the so They're going to Montlake Terrace, like, 
I think though it's really a sub area study at this point of form, but we need to we need a consultant on board to be able to make the feasibility study in essence around that corridor. Um, and I, I don't know if that's really um, within our wheelhouse at this point. Really, it's a matter of the council, you know, allocating those funds and uh, having a contract put out for for that. Um, I personally would like to look at the the tree ordinance, and I know there's a separate group, but perhaps we can collaborate with that group because we just finished the tree canopy study. But again, as I've said before, there's no discussion about how we manage it. And the permitting process right now, as it stands, uh, you have to go, every time you go in, you have to get a biologist to look at it. But again, if we could have, uh, I think there's a forest management plan, but if we could look at to see how we can streamline that process for residents to be able to come up with a, a lot specific plan uh, and maybe it's a collaboration with the, the, the tree board but you know I, that to me seems like something that we could get our teeth into and really help the city help the residents you know have it uh, so anyways I will continue to push that as an offer for the group to look at. So. That, that's an ideal as as we can talk about a discussion in 2025 20, tree board is working on tree list, updating it, and the diameters. That will go into an ordinance, go forward, but that's what they're doing with Drew. She has the independence to work on those ordinances. She is also a great resource to come and explain what the codes are, what the processes are, what they could be, and not detract from our bad work. Existing resource, she has time, and I'm so awesome. Yeah. She's she's an expert. So, so that could be one of the sub conversations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make, yeah. But, but I think what we need to do is look at what's the meaning between the gym and the center. Yeah, it's a bit. <laughs> yeah. So I get I guess one comment um to your point, Lois. I, I guess I'm imagining this discussion around economic development and so forth is possibly starting out in a way where it's not about consultants and experts. Like I think one of the things, and I've had several, you know, friends and neighbors mention this, you know, like, hey, have you guys, have you guys just pulled some local, you know, developers or business leaders together to come talk with you, right? We don't need a consultant to that. We will need some staff time. I, I don't mean to say it's totally free and easy of effort, but I don't think it's about starting by hiring a consultant. I think about it more as bringing in, you know, whether it's commercial or residential, you know, experts to come talk with us, have a conversation. I think there'd be interest in even community, you know, hearing that type of conversation because that comes up all the time. So that's kind of what I was thinking about as first steps rather than, hey, city council, go find money, go find a consultant. Maybe that's what comes out of it to help us think through what we could change going forward. But I'm thinking about this more as like fact finding and, and understanding what's going on. You know, yeah, I mean, why are we not seeing things? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you, you, you and I talked about this, gosh, like before the comp planning started, it was something we wanted to do with that property owner over by, um, uh, what do you call it, Pacific Exteriors, uh, that, that lot that's been scheduled for multifamily and it's not been built, but it's been on the market. Remember that conversation we had? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a really great idea. I'd love to revive that I, idea of bringing in um, developers in our community to find out, you know, I, I think in many ways, we when we had that conversation before, it was about also finding out what works for them and what doesn't, which could inform mm -hmm. our middle housing work uh, to, to understand where the, like, the thresholds are for what makes, you know, a duplex maybe more attractive than a you know, a single family or what might make a triplex more attractive and use the triplex as an incentive um, over a single family. But I, I don't think we have that clarity from uh, the per the people who have the capital to do it. We I'd be happy to entertain that with our time. But again, I, I'm not sure. I think we're going to hit a wall because I uh, really we I mean, we need somebody to come up with a map of the area. Uh, look at the map and do like a, a critical areas overlay on that. And I think that's really, um, we can talk about, I, I love the idea of bringing developers in. It 
you know, it, it's a great way to, to get us thinking about it. But truly to pursue it requires kind of data, you know, kind of having um, a consultant, a paid consultant to come up with these maps, come up with this survey. Uh, and, but we can absolutely, I would be totally for discussing it. Um, well, I think it's more yeah. of a discussion. But, it's more of a focus if we go down, down the round. Uh, yeah. So that we can actually, you know, so we have that conversation where we determine what we want the data, and then we, we perhaps we approach the city council and say, hey, this is our, this is what we propose. This is what we think, right? Uh, how we might want to address this economic development in this. We can absolutely have that discussion and decide, do we put it for a vote to go to the count? I guess what I'm trying to get the group to think about is, what are the deliverables that we as a group want to provide, right? Um, we can have these discussions. Um, do we, at the end of it, want to actually formally uh, vote to uh, propose something to the council? But as a group, I'm asking you guys to consider what deliverables we can provide. Uh, you guys have labor. We can talk about design elements. We can talk about commercial developments. But uh, it's a missed opportunity because we, this is a formal group, and I, I think being able to come up with something concrete would be ideal. So, so give us an example of something that would be concrete. Okay. Um, I did the tree canopy. <laughs> if we look okay. at it's just us looking over the ordinance to see any weak spots. So we can consider how can we. Um, so, Lose, I, I invite yeah. you to go to the tree board and attend one of the meetings and ask them what. What might be missing? I would be. I just. I guess. Uh, can you tell me what am I missing then? Please. Tell I, me I don't. Uh, so. So I. What I, am I missing then? I, I think. Might I just say, the tree ordinance is one example. I push that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you disagree, you can absolutely disagree. We're all here to try to build the city together or, or just make our time more productive. Is, is that correct? And I'm not trying to say we can't talk about this stuff. I, I guess um, because we are somewhat of an organized group, uh, we have the ability to look at things like the ordinance, inconsistencies, and that makes so much sense. And that to me is a, a really good use of our time. Um, I'm not sure of me going to the tree ordinance. What What is it that you would like to tell me that I'm missing? Because clearly there's something that you see that I'm not seeing. So please, I would love to know what that is. Well, I, I, for one thing, I yeah. do not want to step on. There's a tree board that exists for, for a reason, right? And as another council or another entity that's the plan, I do not want the planning commission stepping on the on the preview of the, of the tree no, I'm collaborate. I'm proposing okay. we collaborate because um, I have we have a, actually a, a planning commissioner who bumped up against the the the, 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 the tree ordinance, oh. and um, she did go before the planning the tree board. Um, it's a it's it's um it perhaps needs to be updated because the management of the forestry the tree canopy really falls on the residents, and the sign ordinance doesn't keep up with that ability to do that and. And that's what I'm saying with it is absolutely within our purview to be able to look at that ordinance and say, hey, it doesn't make sense because the, for example, as I pointed out to the group, residents have to go back, they they go and get a permit. This is the current situation. They need to get uh, a biologist to stamp one tree. And then if they have a second tree, they need to go through that whole process again. Is and and we have to then call the biologist, the horticulturalist again. Uh, so this is the state of the ordinance as it stands. It's very costly. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars for the residents. But if the if we could come up with a site plan, which we already do when we look at properties and developments and that sort of thing, if Drew is, is really talented, uh, as it sounds she is, Drew should be able to look at diseased trees and help in, in a basically a, a permitted plan for that property, you should be able to identify there are three trees that are diseased or overgrowing or, or something of that nature. And not just look at one, but look at all three 
She added yeah. that for us like maybe a month ago. She came out to the yeah. site survey. I don't know if that's the same thing. It is, but then it expires. How, how long did you have to, to do that? So I think so, it's like two years. So right? I wonder if we could shift the conversation to, uh, which I, I totally get that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if, we, for the sake of time, looking at what, what we want to accomplish, because you need to take this to city council, that's our 2025 plan. Yeah. If we just vote on what we see as being the, the focus. That's what I'm saying. That's what we're talking yeah. about right now is, is what we're going to do for this remainder of the time. I, I got that's what you're talking about. But I understand this. Vote on those options. And I agree with you, with all due respect, but you were asking me why I'm talking about that. So no, I, just wasn't, make sure. I was asking you for a concrete example. Okay, so, and I, yeah, I guess I, I was, I thought it was clear that perhaps it was not. Um, and, you know, Yanni, I'm okay talking about the economic development. I love that, really, you know, but uh, is uh, the question I have is, is there something that we could do to maybe, as a planning commission, I expect to look at zoning codes, I expect to look at the ordinances, um, talking about what could be built. What, I, I love that too, but really, we all know, I mean, I pointed out the problem. We have a funding problem, and we could talk about it till we're blue in the face. But really, uh, meaningfully uh, helping the city would be. I, I think the council already has, you know, enough um, gears to think about this problem more so than us. Uh, that's why I think uh, deciding what we're going to do with the the four million dollars. I think you guys can handle that. <laughs> um, but I think for us, uh, we sh I'm just looking for areas where we could help with the financial shortfall that the city has and see where we can, you know, we as a group can come into play for that. And that's what I'm asking um, the group to consider. If, so yeah. if I may say in the remaining time, because um, I think this is well taken, Lois, I think, you know, there's definitely an opportunity to learn more about what the tree board is doing. And to Mark's point, we can even have a briefing on that to see if there's opportunities to collaborate or to support in the deliverables. I might just continue what you were doing and put on the board yeah. the ideas we've been talking about. So maybe we can get to uh, the council member Levo's idea of here's what we think we're going to work on. Here's some other things we talked about. Um, and so much is going to change between now and then. So I don't think we have to have a locked in stone exactly what we're going to do this month and this month and this month, because we don't know how this is going to play out. But what I've heard is economic. I was spelling that wrong. Tree. And what I heard over here on middle housing, we had some, we were kind of, Yana, you had kind of bucketed that as RUEs. Remind me, yeah. what else was there? Uh, current regulations and the climate element. Design standards. Design standards, maybe. And I think the ADU is also um, relevant to this, this, this the middle housing discussion. Right. Talked about that. Was there anything else we talked about? that we felt was part of one of those two elements or that we've talked about potentially for second half of year? You did talk about uh, street, safe streets. That's true. Opportunities there. And there was a question of, I think, was that the one that somebody had said, is that really our purview or is that somebody else's purview? Or could it be in another bucket? And my question would be, is that what active transportation means? Um, it's a combination. So what active transportation might be cars and uh, vehicles, but there's also passive uh, transportation. They're all adjacent. They're all adjacent. But isn't there an effort for active transportation land? I would just offer that there's opportunities for the city to do better. Okay. <laughs> we have a guy who not well, of safe streets, well and, uh, a, a active transportation initiative. So one's like a guiding document, one's an initiative, one's community interest, right? Traffic calming came out of like ongoing community feedback of wanting, you know, safer non motorized transportation. So I think they're all adjacent, they're just different inputs. So is that one that there's consensus or at least some interest of the commission that we would kind of propose as a future workshop? Yeah. I, mean, I, I guess I'm confused in what capacity, like again, what, and are we just, 
talking about it and like we all I mean what are we talking about like what's what's the deliverable that we're trying to achieve in that discussion yeah, I guess that's an updated safe streets safe document plan. because uh when it came up a few months ago I think we talked about whether or not it uh accounted for um uh, like when it got published there may have been things that were still missing from it like some people didn't feel like their street was in you know recognized appropriately or the treatment that was recommended was an appropriate treatment We've also had the light rail station open, so it's really about what in the safe streets document is still relevant, what needs updating, and um, and and doesn't account for you know the side of transportation. And I mean, it's really First, just yeah, the yeah. deliverable would be an updated safe streets document. Totally, yeah. Another one that I would like to throw the post plan is really, 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 really outdated. Like which really, plan? The post plan that our comp plan yeah, refers to. Space trail, but again, I don't know if the parks that you know, I don't know if that's the it park is. That would be another, yeah. Budget. We can get planning commission input, yeah. it's budgeted for 2025, greatly reduced, focused on one effort. What do we have? What's happening? A little the parks recreation board is the primary committee, yeah, or is the staff member. I believe there's 30,000 in the draft budget, and planning commission input can be given to that existing effort. Yeah, all those to me, I, I think are are very good. Um, and I mean, this to me yeah. strikes me as okay. ambitious. And if there's a need where something exigent comes up that council wants us to work on that we learn about here, or that is an exigent issue that comes up, we can propose an update to the council of what we work on if we need to shift priorities. But how does this look to people? That's great, yeah. Are we voting on this then, or are we? I think, Yanni, yeah. do you have, were you gonna, you probably can't even see this, I'm sorry. No, I can't see the writing from from on my little screen here, but I, I appreciate your, your trying to organize things visually, that, that always helps. I mean, I'm not, I mean, to me, I don't think there, I've heard any of these topics as being something that we all feel just doesn't belong here at all. We ha we're having some discussions about what are we trying to achieve? And I think that's valid. We're not going to solve that tonight. So what I think we could do is maybe just create some language and I could take a stab at this and circulate it, but to basically describe what these bins are, what do we mean? So that the council can look at our stuff and say, hey, okay, they've got these three things that they they know they want to tackle soon because they relate to middle housing. Then there are these other things that, you know, we have we have some ideas about how to move forward with it. Some are a little bit more vague. And but let's get let's get some you know reaction to that. We can't do all of this in 2025. We can't. So I would love to hear if, you know, council says, you know what, why don't you guys wait till 2026? We're asking the tree board to do X, Y, and Z. Or maybe they say, you know, parks, you know, parks plan, better to, you know, wait. I don't know if that's the answer. I'm just trying to give examples here of the scenarios. And, you know, let's get that feedback from them. We know what we got to do in the first six months. So that gives us some room to, you know, prioritize for the second. And I want to say we're, we're down about seven minutes. So that's the other reason I'm like, let's not, I don't actually think we need to vote this list. I don't think because we're trying to describe what we see as important topics. I'm not hearing anybody saying strike that topic entirely. So let's document them and let's get some feedback. Mark, do you think we need a motion or are we good if we just get work? We're, we're ahead of the game. We we, we have the list. Okay. November meeting, December meeting, formulate your draft work plan. I started on January 8th and we did work plan at city council, but that must have been January, February. I forget what the code says, but I'll snap the picture. We have two more shots to do this. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. And I'll yeah. send it to you, Yanni. Yeah, again, send me those photos. Thank you very much. Um, so let's thank you, everyone. I, I I really appreciate the discussion. And again, it's a little hard to lead a discussion from here, but there we go. We're doing what we can. Um, any uh, do we have any new business? 
We do not. Excellent. Let's talk about planning commission vacancies and recruitment. Mr. Cranmer is uh, relocating after this year, um, is willing to stay on for the remainder of the year, but transition. The city clerk's doing a recruitment for planning commission, tree board, parks board. And I think that's it. Don't know that we have any active applicants, but if you have any ideas, suggestions, outreach, funnel them to the mayor through the city clerk and they'll keep advertising. Um, but we know that uh, Melissa uh, Kramer is short term. Okay. Um, but there's no, there's not like a firm application deadline. It's an ongoing process until we get some good people. Yes. Okay. And just All to, right. Uh, uh, next year, I think we are done too. I think you guys are losing two more commissioners next year. So Tom said it that he reinstated us for the full term. Really, so. <laughs> yeah. You were informed. <laughs> no, you were. I just there were so many emails. I know that that last email was definite because he did the research, and it was a long time. It doesn't mean we have to. Fill it. And so, yeah. uh, one of the things well, I, thought was I said to Ashton is depending on what kind of candidate pool you get, it looks like we need to replace Melissa. And I wouldn't leave a vacant seat because I've shared long enough with vacant seats and it's it's kind of hard to build okay. that cohesion. So, I'm, I'm glad to stick around until there's somebody that's really just awesome that we can onboard without it feeling like we've lost steam as a group. I mean, I do believe them for a moment. So, but not necessarily, you know, hankering to stay around for two more years, although I am I am very interested in this work that is going on. I just don't want to take up, you know, space that maybe can be filled by somebody else in the community. Our housing forum, you guys have 80 people in attendance between online and in person. And, oh, wow. I you know, I'm really optimistic that, you know, somebody might come out of that and say, you know, turn it up. You, you well, I'd, I'd say as as current yeah. vice chair, I really appreciate your willingness to to stay on until we have a good um, yeah. succession plan. So I appreciate that. And uh, and, you know, things also happen. People sometimes have to step down from things and it would be great if we had a, you know, a little bit of a pool of people who are interested, even if we don't have a seat right away. So I think, you know, we should all do some reaching out. I already tried to convince somebody who I thought would have been great, but he just doesn't think he can handle it schedule wise right now, but I, I might try him again. <laughs> um, all right. So I don't think we have any public uh, citizen resident uh, comments. Um, I, I want to make a comment about that agenda item though. And I know that we did this in the comp plan and I believe and I've seen this a lot in my work at the county, we're getting rid of the term citizen a lot because it implies something in the and can be a loaded term, in fact, because citizen of a place has some meaning as opposed to a resident. So I'm just curious if at some point we might consider um, changing even the name of the item on our standing agenda. So just something to think about it's it's that discussion is happening enough in my world that now it's like whenever I see that word I, I kind of question whether it should be there um so I'll, there we go it. it may just be a typo <laughs> um yeah, it could seems be. like we could the public like well the others. first page at the beginning of the meeting consistent with the clerk and throughout all the things it says public comments then you flip yeah. the page and it's additional citizen comments. So yeah, I, I would uh, suggest we change that to additional public comment. I will ask Matt and go from there. Matt has control over the Zoom webinar and the formatting of agendas. We just do content. Great. Okay. Um, so agenda for next meeting, I think we're going to get pretty deep or get start really getting into our middle housing business and sounds like we need to finalize some work plan stuff. Is that right, Mark? Does that sound right? Yes. 
Okay. All right. Anything else for the good of the order before we look for a motion to adjourn right at nine o'clock? Okay. Anyone I'm like to move? Second. <laughs> All in favor? All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. 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 Thank you.